the sensationalization of Hugo actually came from publishers in London. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kitty Mary and today we are going to talk about Hugo. Now, I have made in the impact analysis series a couple of videos about something that's not necessarily a material or a product, but it's more like a concept, like the video we did about minimalism. And today I thought I wanted to talk about Hygge. It was suggested to me on Instagram that I talk about this concept because she is Danish, so she should probably know what she's talking about. And also it's a term that over the last 10 years or so gained enormous traction online. I want to take a look at how this concept of Hygge ties into consumerism, how to partake in Hygge in a more sustainable way and what misconceptions that might be lurking around both online, in media, etc. Is this the most urgent subject in sustainability? No, I have other videos about much more urgent topics, so you can go and watch that and we're just gonna have a good time, we're gonna cozy up, pun intended, and talk about something where we don't necessarily feel like the entire world is falling apart. I've been told that I'm sometimes a little doomsday and I don't wanna be doomsday, I don't wanna ruin the mood, we have Hugo, it's fine. This energy is gonna come into play later on in this video. <laughs> Anyway, Hygge is not necessarily something that invites a huge environmental footprint, but it can be, or versions of it can be tied to consumerism, and if you're one of those people that find Hygge or like the philosophy or the concept or the cultural phenomenon really interesting, this might be interesting for you. It might be interesting, like really, really selling this video right now. I'm gonna have a good time, hopefully you guys are gonna stay with me, like cuddle up, find a cup of tea, put on your best fussy socks, your PJs, and uh, let's vibe. The definition of Hugo reads, a quality of coziness and comfortable conviviality that engenders a feeling of contentment or well-being. Hugo is regarded as a defining characteristic of Danish culture and classic examples of Hugo can be lighting candles or wearing PJs, other types of comfortable clothing, sitting by the fireplace, eating cakes or cardamom buns, cozying up with friends or family in dim lighting, wearing a big jumper, having a picnic, playing board games with friends, reading a good book, woven textiles, pastries, cafe latte foam art in big chunky mugs, you probably get the point. And while it seems like the Danes are often noted as the inventors of Hugo, Hugo is actually a word that comes from Norwegian and it means well-being and overlapping meaning is existent in Danish as well. It also generally means comfort and well-being. And fun fact, Hugo appeared in the Danish written language in the early 1800s. Despite the popular belief that we will circle back to in a second that Hugo is an exclusively Danish phenomenon, there are actually quite a few words with overlapping meanings in other languages as well, including German, Serbian, Dutch, Norwegian, etc. In Danish we use Hugo in a lot of different ways. It's a word that we use in our language, in our casual language, in our written language, constantly and all the time. You can use it as a noun or as a compound noun. You can use it as a verb and as an adjective. We say hygge quite a lot. <laughs> if we use it as an adjective, we say something is hygelit, like a mood can be hygelit. We don't say a mood is hygge, we say a mood is hygelit instead. And then you say it's, hy it's more hygelit, it's less hygelit. Etc. Comment down below if you find this language lesson interesting. We also say hygdai, which means like hyg you. Um, and that's a pretty common phrase if you are saying goodbye to someone. If we want to say that an item is hygge, if we want to say or specify that an item is hygge, we put hygge in front of that item. We describe PJs and sweatpants usually as hygge boxer or hygge pants. And that's generally a way for us to describe that this is a piece of clothing that we don't wear normally, but that we wear when we relax. It's not very often you see people in their hygge attire out in the real world. You do sometimes, especially on a Sunday morning. We can also use it as a verb and say which means that we are about to partake in a really hygge activity. And although many of the classic examples of hygge usually involve winter activities, mainly because the winter in Scandinavia is really long and it really sucks and it's really cold, Hygge is not season specific, so you can partake in Hygge activities all year around. It's not something that you only do during the winter. You can also partake in the activities during the summer. And 
language wise at least it makes perfect sense another fun fact in danish the opposite of hygge is uhygge or non hygge on hygge and directly translated in danish it means scary a funnier fact is that a lot of scary things uhygli can sometimes actually be hygge like halloween or watching a scary movie with friends that i would categorize as hygge even though it is uhygge anyway <laughs> While I think there are many misconceptions and misunderstandings about what hygge actually constitutes, one of the bigger ones I think is that hygge is untranslatable, which I definitely see quite a lot roaming around on the internet. And personally speaking, I think that both cozy and well-being and being comfortable, etc. covers what hygge means quite nicely. Obviously, whenever you take a word and not only translate it into another language, but from one culture to another, there are nuances and differences that are going to be different. But overall, when I say cozy, I mean hygge. And when I say hygge, I mean cozy. Also in this video. One thing that I noticed was pretty funny about how hygge was received internationally and worldwide and how Danes reacted to suddenly everyone talking about hygge is that Danes do this thing where we really cling on to our things, that we really, really like our stuff and we love when other people talk about our things. And we don't necessarily care whether or not it's true that this doesn't appear in any other language or culture. We are just gonna pretend that it's true. And it's not only with Hugo, it's with basically everything. We love when a famous person is part Danish. We lose our minds whenever we see a Carlsberg logo in a Hollywood movie. And we're absolutely thrilled whenever someone mentions Hans Christian Andersen. We love our things quite a lot. And I think one of the reasons why Hugo received such international recognition was because of this branding technique, because of the Danish mentality that we are the only ones that know how to have a good time, so check this out. It's at least a mentality that a lot of Danes partake in. We're also quite proud of being the happiest people on earth, again whether or not that's true. But we do have a lot to be happy about because we have universal healthcare, we have free education, we have a month off in the summer, we have paid leave, Generally speaking, there are a lot of big issues that we don't necessarily have to think or worry about a whole lot. And that does make it easier to be happy, or calm, or relaxed, or mellow, or chill, or hygge. However, I think it's important to not romanticize the Danish experience. Danish foreign politics, for instance, are only becoming stricter and stricter, which is absolutely embarrassing. Hate crimes against immigrants and the LGBTQ plus community is also rising in Denmark, and there's a large part of the population that simply doesn't believe that racism or sexism exists in Denmark. It does. Just for clarification. Now, I really want to underline, I'm actually quite happy to be Danish. Saying anything else would be absolutely tone deaf. I had the immense privilege coming from a country that is incredibly wealthy. I have a lot of opportunities available to me. And saying that I am unhappy being Danish would also be a lie. But it's not a perfect country, it's not a perfect system, and it's important to not glamorize the experience of Denmark. Trust me, there's plenty we do wrong. And this doesn't only go for Denmark, it's important to overall not glamorize or romanticize a country, a demographic or a culture as though they can do no wrong. Trust me, we do plenty wrong. Anyway, I really cannot stand this mentality that Hygge is an inherently Danish thing, no one else knows how to relax and have a good time. That's simply not true. But I think this unique marketing strategy has also played a really big part in the capitalization and the commercialization of the concept. It's a lot easier to sell a quality to a large group of people if they are told that they don't already possess that quality. And you can buy so many Hugo themed items. You can buy cards and board games and home decor and clothing and tea and candles with the words Hugo written on it for no real reason. There were an immense number of books published about Hugo within the last eight years or so. Like Hugo, the Danish art of happiness, the little book of Hugo, the Danish way to live well, Hugo, a celebration of simple pleasures, living the Danish way, the cozy life, rediscover the joy of simple things through the Danish concept of Hugo, Hugo, the complete guide to embracing the Danish concept of cozy and simple living, the art of Hugo, how to bring Danish coziness into your life, how to Hugo, the secrets of Nordic living, the book of Hugo, the Danish art of living well, keep calm and Hugo, a guide to Danish art and simple and cozy living. 
Actually, in 2016, Hugo was on the way to becoming Britain's word of the year, only to be beaten by Brexit, obviously. And in a span of only a few months in the US, eight books were published by major publishing companies about Hugo. It's definitely something that speaks to the popularity of Hugo. I also asked you guys on Instagram where you knew Hugo from, uh, if you knew it from like your upbringing, your childhood, sort of your language, if you didn't know it at all, or if you knew it from media, magazines, books, etc. And over half of you guys that answered my poll said that you knew it from books, media, and television. So going into the commercialization of Hugo a little bit, one of the things that I often see happening is that when Hugo is introduced, it is either by introducing very specific examples of Hugo, which makes the concept seem very, very strict, or it's described as something really vague that often makes it seem like this really big, complex philosophical mindset. And these classic examples of different types of Hugo, like going ice skating, wearing PJs, lighting candles, dim lighting, all that kind of stuff, etc. Makes it seem as though there are some very strict rules you have to follow in order to wing off the Hugo aspect. And that's not really true. I did see a lot of people comment uh, when I asked you guys on Instagram what you think constitutes Hugo, and I did see people say that, well, it's, it's more like something people do in the winter, and it's not really something people do in the summer. And I think the reason why many Hugo examples are from the winter time is because, again, as I said, in Scandinavia we have so much winter and it's so cold and it's so long, it lasts forever, so obviously a lot of the activities that we are partaking in in that part of the year will constitute a big part of the definition of Hugo, but it's not season specific, it just means having a nice time. And you can easily do that in the summertime as well. Some of these specifications also makes it seem as though things that are pleasant are pleasant to everybody or universally known facts that they're pleasant. And what people define as comfort or having a good time is an incredibly subjective thing to do. So while there are some people that might categorize some activities as Hugo, I wouldn't personally think they were Hugo. And some things I find Hugo that a lot of people might not see as Hugo. It's a very subjective thing, so I wouldn't say you're wrong, that's not Hugo, this is what Hugo is, I would never do that. Obviously there are no really strict rules, but just like there are things that are universally known to be unpleasant or uncomfortable, there are also things that are universally known to be not Hugo. It's just there aren't really any universal guidelines you have to follow in order to say something is Hugo. It's completely up to you. There are no products that you have to buy, no certain mindset you have to agree with, no specific actions you have to partake in, nothing. Personally, as a Dane, I don't see Hugo as a philosophical concept that I specifically engage with in my daily life. That's not how I use the word or its meaning. I simply use it to say that something is nice and comfortable for me. However, I do see a lot of people on social media having a lot more strict rules for what constitutes Hugo. I guess because they have their definition of it from books and articles and lifestyle blogs. This way of using Hugo isn't actually that Danish because it isn't a phenomenon that we actively partake in. It's just something that's organically there. It's something that we, ju it's just a word that we use to describe when we have a good time. In a video not very long ago, I mentioned Hugo in one context or another, and I actually, for weeks after, got comments and DMs from people saying that I misunderstood the concept of Hugo, that I needed to read these books and these articles and just be a little bit more educated about what Hugo actually meant because I used it in the wrong way. And I tell you, I was laughing so hard I couldn't breathe. <laughs> It was just the most un-Danish way of using a Danish phenomenon that I've ever seen in my life. The writer of the book, The Little Book About Hugo, says this about Hugo. Hugo is such an important part of being Danish that it's considered a defining feature in our cultural identity and an integral part of the national DNA. In other words, what freedom is to Americans, Hugo is to Danes. And while I think this comparison is a little bit dramatic, I also agree with sort of the foundation of where it's coming from. Obviously, Hugo is not written into our laws and our constitution, so if the comparison has some merit, it's a more mellow type of attitude we have towards Hugo. Like, I feel like 
basing this on basically nothing, but you feel free to correct me down below. But I feel like Americans are a little bit more hardcore about their freedom than we are about Hugo. You will not see any Danes protesting for Hugo. Just... One article I found on the topic compares how many people internationally now associate everything Danish with Hugo in a similar fashion to how internationally when we hear something is French we often associate it with chic. Not that that's a bad thing or anything, but I think that might be a more true comparison. Fun fact, and I don't know if this is 100% true, but I read this in an article and I think it's a little bit funny and also explains the international craze for Hugo. This article says that the books about Hugo that became wildly popular in both the US and the UK weren't actually thought up by Danes because, and this article says, Danes take Hugo as part of their language and culture for granted so they had to find someone who wanted or could write about Hugo so that they could sell books. And the little book about Hugo has sold over 1 million copies and is sold in 23 different countries. So there's definitely demand for books about this topic. I just don't necessarily think it's Danish demand. I think this is funny and it also speaks into the capitalization of Hugo that it didn't actually come from Danish demand or from Danes having a need to communicate this Hugo thing to the rest of the world. The whole concept of turning Hugo into products that you can sell didn't really come from Denmark. So is everything you read in these books wrong? No, absolutely not. I don't know because I actually haven't read any books about Hugo, but there might be a lot of merit to what some of these books are saying and they might be intensely useful for one reason or another and I am not going to sit here and shame or judge anyone who really likes these books. Obviously not literally do you. But I think it's interesting to see where this interest originated from and who's the target demographic for these types of products. And one point I want to make is that when we experience or when we buy certain products that are based on cultural phenomena and lifestyles from other cultures and other countries, we should often take these publications and products with a grain of salt because sometimes it's not necessarily that deep. Now we have established that Hugo in its core state is rather uncommercial. It's about well-being, feeling comfortable. It's this fussy feeling that Danes constantly walk around with without a care in the world. And there are absolutely no downsides to Hugo. What is that? Oh, there are? Okay, as far as I'm informed, none of the publications about Danish Hugo really go into detail with the downsides to this mentality or the ways that Hugo culturally can be used in a rather detrimental way. Because it definitely can, speaking as a Danish person. One thing that I notice a lot in our political landscape is that Danish politicians are usually quite popular and likable if they are approachable and can be described as Hugli. Danes, or at least a lot of Danes, really like or gravitate towards politicians that feel relatable or like a dude you want to have a beer with is how one of our former prime ministers have been described many times. He has been described as a hookly kind of guy. And I think this speaks into the fact that Danes love a good mood, a mellow, nice, comfortable mood. We don't necessarily, culturally speaking, I mean, this is like an exaggeration, obviously, but from my own experiences, from many other Danes, it's not necessarily like culturally appropriate to have deep, serious discussions over the dinner table that might ruin the hygge. And that sometimes makes it really difficult to have serious conversations with your friends and family. Culturally speaking, we also take a lot of really serious issues extremely lightly. One way that Hugo is used in our language is to describe racism. We have a specific type of racism or we have a word for a specific type of racism called Hugo racism, which is a very normal word in Danish. It's something that most Danes know what means. It covers everything from making racist jokes to or about people of color. It means using slurs in songs and movies and jokes or using racist or offensive decorations etc. All of this is usually categorized as Hugo racism, which means that culturally in Denmark we often separate racism into two or three different groups and a lot of people have a very hard time understanding that all the types of racism actually go together. 
and make each other possible. So we have systemic racism, we have like fatal violence based racism where people are killed or beaten up because of the skin color. But then we have all the Hugo racism, which is the non-harmful types of racism that doesn't in any way, shape or form cover or make foundation for the other types of racisms to thrive. Absolutely not. The Hugo racism has nothing to do with the rest of the stuff that's happening, at least culturally speaking, that's often the mentality and the attitude towards racism in Denmark. Yeah, I have been at parties or gatherings where I have wanted to draw a line for certain types of behavior, both against myself as well as other people, where I have been told not to ruin the hygge, which I think encapsulates the downsides of this mentality pretty well. And I know for a fact that it's something a lot of Danes, especially younger people, experience a lot when they try to question the status quo. This type of hygge, or hygge in this context, often means staying at surface level emotionally. It means not going into detail with a lot of things personally for yourself. It means not necessarily discussing anything political. It means overall not too serious issues either. Hygge as a mood is fragile, or at least it can be fragile. Not only about what we wear, what we drink, or how dim our lighting is, it also has a lot to do with how we are with other people, how we maintain relationships with people that are close to us, friends, family, etc., and how we make them feel for better or for worse. It often comes with an expectation of maintaining these relationships and making other people feel good in a certain scenario, again, for better or for worse. In Denmark, hygge is often a social norm as much as it is an aesthetic. And that comes with upsides and downsides. I guess if I had to reach a conclusion for this video, it would be that language and how we use language to communicate social expectations and tradition and norms is an incredibly complex thing. And it isn't necessarily likely that we're able to fully comprehend the meanings of these words if we only consume them or are acquainted with them through the lens of commercial goods. It's more likely that the versions of these cultural phenomena and lifestyles and mindsets that are advertised to us is a boiled down version that's specifically designed to be appealing to the demographic it's being advertised and sold to. Meaning that there might be a million variations that we aren't going to be acquainted with because we are not present in the cultural setting where it naturally flourishes. That's also the reason why you don't necessarily see a lot of hygge themed products in Danish shops. You do see them in souvenir shops or in neighborhoods and areas and boutiques where a lot of tourists come through. Of course I think we should be completely free to feel inspired or motivated by any type of cultural phenomenon or any type of concept or mindset or lifestyle that we see from other cultures but I think it's important to not glamorize these things or not to simplify them too much and especially to be critical of who is actually communicating them to us. Overall, the lifestyle of Hugo or the concept of Hugo has a lot of potential to be very sustainable. It focuses on simplicity, simple pleasures, consuming things in moderation. It's a very uncommercial way of living or way of existing at least. And there's a lot of merit in that, that overlaps with sustainability. And those parts might be incredibly inspiring and motivating to a lot of other people, but I definitely agree with the article that mentions that I think Danes take this word for granted, not in a negative way, but just that it's so ingrained into our DNA that sitting here and taking it apart and really trying to explain it is really, really difficult because it's just feeling okay, not consuming too much, having simple things that we enjoy quite a lot. And if that's something that is otherwise foreign to you, obviously this is going to seem like a very different way of living and that might be a really good thing. So I hope you enjoyed this semi deep dive into what Hygge actually is from an environmentalist who is also a Danish person. Let me know your thoughts down below. I would love to hear sort of your take on these things. That could be really interesting. And if you want to check out some of my other videos, feel free to do that. I usually talk about some issues that are a little bit more serious than this. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!